thank you very much for joining us for this event. We are grateful for your participation. So here we are. I'm uh, Thorsten Kreening, your host today and co-publisher of Space Watch Global. We are a Switzerland-based we are Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about our um, space, new space activities in a geopolitical context. Many of you uh, know our website and our bi-weekly newsletter. We have also just launched our new daily newsletter called Spacewatch GL Today, this week. And uh, we will be hosting these Space Cafe web talks on a weekly basis. Too. So um, we hope you will mark Tuesdays as this time um, in your calendars. Without further ado, I would like to hand over to my guest and my good friend, Moriba Ja. Moriba is professor at the University of Texas at Austin. He has built an outstanding career in the space sector with a mission to protect our Earth, which I know he will talk about in a few minutes. As we mentioned in the event invitation, Moriba published an op-ed in Space Watch Global a few weeks back called Orbital Space, the next resource for humanity to exhaustively exploit and litter. Just a quick poll, uh, who read this? Uh, I'm not sure if you can see this poll. Would be great uh, if you can click in if you did or if you didn't. Let me also mention that we are recording this session and it will be available on spacewatch.global in a few days. We tried also to live stream on Facebook, but that it didn't work for whatever reason. Um, so we don't do that. If you would like to ask a question, just use the Q&R section on the Zoom webinar screen and vote also for questions. If you don't get your questions answered during the session, we will follow up with it later. And with that, and I'm just checking the poll here, we had 27 answers. So 30% read the, the op-ed and 67 didn't. So there's a good chance that a few people at least can connect with what you wrote. So um, thank you, Moriba. <coughs> floor is yours. The virtual All floor right. is yours. Yeah, well, um... You know, uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're located. Thank you for uh, having me and for joining us. And uh, let's get, let's get through this because I, I want to definitely make sure that we leave enough uh, time for questions and answers. And let me see if I can. Uh... All right, here we go. So uh, I want to focus on this thing called space situational awareness and this idea of space traffic management in near earth space you know why is it important why should we care and 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 frankly what are the things that are happening right now that maybe you're not completely aware of uh, just trying to click through this here okay so really um the thing to focus on is that we have this space environment. It's very dynamic. The sun is active. We have, you know, this thing called gravity field. There are all these things happening uh, in space. And when you have objects in this environment, uh, this environment has effects and impacts on these objects, some of uh, which are not completely understood. Some, some are understood. But think of this as the noise floor, uh, meaning if we really want to understand and be able to monitor, uh, you know, objects in Earth orbit. We really need to understand the effects and impacts of the space environment on their behavior. And so, there's still some science that needs to happen there. And so, these are hazards to operations, hazards to orbital safety. Um, it even has uh, security implications as well. Now, there's never been any domain of human activity uh, to date that has been absent of malicious behavior. And space is no different. Um, you know, just like we have piracy on the seas and, and, and we have malicious behavior on the land, you know, space uh, is going to be no different. And so this is one of the things that we need to be able to 
understand what are the differences in behaviors and be able to build a body of evidence of things that are natural occurrences and hazards and things that could be viewed as threats. All right. So what should uh, space situational awareness provide? So I, I, I say the, the following three things. If we're really interested in achieving space safety, security, and sustainability, our objectives should be to make space transparent, to make it predictable, uh, to help people plan and understand. Um, when things are predictable, uh, there's less room for misinterpretation, which can escalate in ways that nobody really wants to see happen. And we need to build a, a body of evidence of behaviors of stuff in space that we can use to hold people accountable for their behaviors. We have the Outer Space Treaty. We have Article 6. It mentions things like, you know, governments being responsible, uh, you know, for their citizenry uh, and how they behave irrespective of whether or not these entities are, are government, inherently governmental. It could be commercial entities uh, that launch from a specific country. And so ultimately, it is the responsibility of uh, you know, governments to ensure that people are following all the things stipulated in the Outer Space Treaty and are behaving in peaceful ways and these sorts of things. And it mentions this idea of continuous monitoring, which I would argue nobody is really doing well. Nobody is continuously monitoring everything that's happening in space. People try, but we don't have ubiquitous uh, monitoring. We don't have this persistent monitoring kind of thing. All right, so essential ingredients for success. One of the things that I've heard globally is that we need an independent way to verify and validate and you know quantify and assess how people are behaving it can't just be whatever one country says or whatever one company says or one organization it needs to be a consortium uh with stakeholders from all across the globe we need to have metrics for sustainability as well uh i would say you know three takeaways about near earth space is one Near space is geopolitically contested. We have countries that are vying for the upper ground um, in space. Space is commercially contested in that uh, there are more and more businesses trying to exploit and leverage near Earth space uh, for their own, uh, uh, you know, profit, uh, you know, purposes, which is fine, but it's a reality. And then we don't just launch things anywhere. Near Earth space is a finite resource and as such is in need of environmental protection. So coming up with me metrics for sustainability in terms of things like a space traffic footprint, which would be a carbon footprint analog, loosely defined as the burden that any object poses on the safety and sustainability of anything else. The idea of a carrying capacity of the environment, orbital capacity that European uh, Space Agency colleagues have, have uh, developed uh, uh, prior. And then World Economic Forum is working on this thing called the Space Sustainability Rating, which would help to incentivize people to behave in ways that lead or are conducive to long-term sustainability of the environment for our benefit and, and that of uh, you know, generations to come. Let's go to the next slide. So interestingly enough, um, you may find it funny, but we do follow the scientific method. And I, I'm surprised at how many people don't do that. So in this slide, I mean, it says uh, research, but you could replace that with operations or other terms. But the first thing that we want to do about near Earth space is ask questions. Everybody um, from commercial operators to different governments have different needs of this uh, finite resource. and so asking some questions, coming up with some beliefs about things happening in space, and then being able to gather some evidence and then see, you know, does the evidence support or does, you know, support or not support these beliefs, uh, reconciling these hypotheses, 
and then uh, basically reporting out uh, these in a way that's transparent. That's basically what we want to be able to to follow that process. Interestingly enough, uh, there's this gentleman, John Boyd, years ago that uh, kind of took the scientific method and repackaged it in a way that uh, for sure people in the United States um, relate to. And it's this thing called the OODA loop, which is observe, orient, decide, and act. And this is probably one of the most important aspects of space situational awareness um, that, that we need to actually apply and be successful at. We can't just observe things uh, and, 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 and just say that we're done. We actually need to map all these observations into a framework where they can be useful because um, not everybody measures things the same way. Not everybody observes things the same way. Every sensor is biased. Every sensor is corrupt in one way or another. Uh, you'd be surprised at how many people uh, might say, yeah, I have this telescope observation. And then when they hand it to you uh, in a community of people, the way they calibrate the sensor, the way they uh, assign timing stamps to, to these things, they can be very different from each other. And so I'd say the critical aspect of this OODA loop, aside from the observations, is this idea to orient these things or again, map this into a lingua franca, some sort of standard that uh, is shareable and that everybody can understand. Once you have all these opinions uh, uh, formed, given the observations and mapped into this kind of lingua franca, then there's this need to decide and then take actions. So we try to really understand this OODA loop and, and put this into practice in our own research. This is a set of currently tracked, uh, you know, objects in Earth orbit from various, uh, you know, users from various catalogs that we represent in this thing called Astrograph. Um, if you haven't seen it, uh, just you know, Google it. You can see it on, you know, uh, your laptop or, or your cell phone. Let's move on to the next next slide. So one of the things that I said is that the space environment has effects and impacts on the way objects behave, de dead or alive. On things that are operational, it can disrupt electronics. Uh, it can cause lots of havoc to operations itself. For things that are not operational anymore, it influences how these things move, where they go to, how these things evolve over time. And we don't completely understand this. So this is definitely, I would say, uh, a technology gap that we need to fill is really understanding the effects and impacts of space environment on resident space objects. One of the interesting things as an example, you know, uh, space situational awareness suffers from not having one-to-one -one causal relationships. And by that I mean, oftentimes, given a body of evidence, multiple hypotheses that can look very different from each other explain said evidence. Uh, one example is uh, there was this uh, you know, space environment storm uh, in 2003. And you know, when your satellite stops working or uh, suffers an anomaly, the question is, why did that happen? What's the cause? Was it because the sun did something? Was it because charged particles did something? Was it a micrometeoroid? Was it a piece of uh, human-made debris? Was it, you know, Jim, Jimmy uh, is, is, doesn't like me so much, so Jimmy did something to my satellite when I wasn't looking. So there's a variety of, of, of hypotheses that could explain the same evidence. And really what we want is we want to have one-to-one -one causal relationships. That's the whole goal. Because the, the larger that list of hypotheses and possible beliefs that could fit the evidence, that basically translates to ambiguity and confusion and people can easily misinterpret things. Let's go on to the next thing. I hear a lot of people talking about detecting versus tracking objects, and let me just give you uh, kind of my concept of the difference between these. Uh, this is an example of uh, detections from a sensor called the Space Surveillance Telescope that's now in Australia. And there's a single night's worth of detections, each of these dots. Um, the black dots are things that were detected and identified as things that we know what they are, you know, with a first and last name. 
And all the dots that are not black are things that we simply detected, but we have no idea, you know, what they are, what they're doing, what they could do. And so this is an issue. It's an issue because, you know, detecting in and of itself is insufficient. We need to be able to detect things and uniquely identify stuff. And in that measure, then we can keep track of things. We can keep custody of these objects. We can follow their patterns and understand their behaviors and learn from that and be able to help in this idea, again, of transparency and predictab predictability and build a body of evidence that can hold people accountable. We have different types and categories of information, it turns out. And, uh, you know, how do you, categories infor how do you, how you categorize information uh, really depends on, on you. And, and, and your own definitions of things. You know, one, one set of data to, to user A could be uh, considered just regular information, but to user B, it could be construed as maybe malinformation because maybe somebody has this intent to cause harm. Uh, there's lots of misinformation out there. There's disinformation, there's omitted information, undisclosed information because some people might want to hide information. So we have to keep these things into account when we try to understand what's going on in near Earth space. And, and we should try to, to the best extent possible, bring in as much evidence as we can to help us figure out in which category uh, are these different uh, uh, sets of information. Our Community also suffers a lot from confirmation bias. And what I mean by that is that we, we build up these beliefs about what's going on in space, and we, we are very reticent to let these things go. We're very reticent. We have this inertia uh, against changing our beliefs. I, I guess that's just in life in general, but certainly uh, with things in space. And the thing is, that's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing for us to hold beliefs uh, to the point where we disregard new evidence. We may have evidence that shows us that things are changing, that things are different than what we believed, but people by and large tend to disregard these things. And so a major element moving forward, especially in our own research, is to try to be allergic to this confirmation bias and always scrutinize our beliefs and always allow for our beliefs to have the possibility to change if evidence is showing us that, you know, we should, that we should change the belief. Thinking back to this idea of space security and malicious behavior in space uh, in this finite resource, you know, what would, what would somebody who's an adversary do potentially? And I would say one or, or, or both of these things. Uh, behave in a way that kind of looks like noise. Um, when, and, and this is back to this idea of the space environment uh, effects and impacts that are not completely understood. We, we don't tend to characterize the structure in the noise. We basically, uh, anything that, that looks like noise, we just say, well, yeah, we don't understand that, and, and, and so be it. We can't do anything about it, which is not completely true. Uh, but, in, but somebody who would want to purposely do something harmful could also look like, you know, an outlier, which we tend to throw away, basically behave in a way that disagrees with our beliefs, uh, behave in a way that uh, is nonsensical, and we'll, we'll tend to disregard that quite quickly. We don't have complete observability into things. When we don't share our information, we only have partial knowledge. Partial knowledge can, re can lead to the wrong decisions. So one of the important factors of sharing information and comparing and contrasting in uh, even big data is be able to have a more complete picture of what's going on uh, because you know aggregate information content can definitely help complete some of these gaps in knowledge. If you wanted to know what the uh, opinions are of what's going on in space, just to give you an example, uh, you know here here's the kind of public U.S. Department of Defense opinion about stuff in space, the space traffic map, as it were. Um, but, but if you wanted to understand uh, what the Russian perspective is, then basically that would be the view. And these things look very different from each other. 
again, back to the partial knowledge. Who's right? Who's wrong? Some of these things are complementary. Some of these things aren't. We want to be able to model things in a way that is, uh, you know, helps us avail ourselves of modern information theory and information science. And so we've structured this thing called astrograph, which is a three-tiered system uh, where the bottom floor is raw information. The middle floor is a knowledge graph database that maps everything into this common language, this idea of the orient part of Buddha. And then the decide and act can come through apps that can interact with astrograph. One of the cool things about knowledge graphs is that it lets us uh, bring in multiple sources of information that can be very disparate from each other, and then through different clustering techniques, see if we can go from data to discovery by looking at patterns that emerge. We want to be able to quantify, monitor, and assess space activities. You know, people talk about space laws and regulations, but you can't enforce something that you can't measure. Um, how do you know who's compliant, who isn't with the law? Multiple source information is usually what we're, we try to figure out to, again, make sure that we're not completely biased and we're not making decisions based on uh, partial information. So one of the things that we did is we looked at compliance and non-compliance with, say, geodisposal guidelines, leveraging this idea of the, these knowledge graphs. This slide just kind of shows you how we label things semantically uh, in the knowledge graph, uh, how we aggregated information. And basically, by labeling things semantically and being able to link you know, these different sources of information, again, somebody can make a query, and then you can query all these different entities in the knowledge graph, apply some analytics, and then be able to come up with some assessments to help people make decisions. Uh, so we did that, and, and in any case, if you go to that website, if you go to Astria, TAC, UTexas, CDU, compliance, you can kind of see the results uh, on, on geodisposal compliance for you know, 500 or so objects. Uh, we also have an annual conference on space traffic management where we partner with the uh, International Academy of Astronautics here at UT every year. So just keep an eye out for that. And that just happened in February. But uh, anyway, I want to open this up to, to questions. Thank you, Mariba. And uh see how we are back here. Um, okay. Um, um, thank you very much for, for, for the talk. Let's go ahead with our and, and kick off the questions. Uh, we got a few of, of them here on the on the channel. Um, the first one um, I would like to ask is um, a question about new space in the private sector in, in new space or and the effects of the current co uh, COVID-19 ep epidemic. Just a few months ago, Leosat collapsed, as we all seen. And uh, just last week, we reported about one web filing for uh, bankruptcy because of their lo uh, lost their funding. Uh, but one, one web has active assets in space. My question is, how, who is in charge? under these circumstances and how we deal with distressed assets in orbit as far as collision avoidance and space debris is concerned, because let's face it, it will not be the last one. Yeah, so uh, ultimately, I'm going to go to the Outer Space Treaty and I'm going to say that it's uh, the responsibility of state actors and governments to, to, to figure this out and keep things uh, safe and, and secure and sustainable in near Earth space. And so even with this uh, collapse with OneWeb and whatnot, um, you know, in, in, in this case, uh, you know, governments need to step up and figure out how to, how to ensure uh, that this, this resource uh, is, is uh, you know, free, free of, of, of these hazards and, and can be accessed in an unhindered kind of way. Okay, great. Um, Daniel, Daniel Poros, or I'll send a question in. If we adapt the rules of the road for satellites, can we monitor all objects for compliance? Yeah, so I think uh, I think the answer is yes. Uh, I believe that uh, you know one set of eyes alone can't do it. We need multiple eyes, so to speak, all over the globe, and we need to combine these eyes into an aggregate data set that can be used for for monitoring and quantifying uh, uh, behavior of, of people on orbit. Make that very transparent. Make it make it very globally public, you know, 
who's doing what uh, to whom and how in space and, 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 and let uh, you know, people decide what to do with that. So absolutely, I believe we can, we can do this monitoring. Great. Uh, Nicolas Florio asks, um, what do you think will be viable types of solutions or to clear such orbital debris? I think the first thing that we need to do is really um, debris mitigation is the main problem. So the cleaning is an issue. You know, the debris removal and remediation is part of the solution. But by and large, most people are not compliant with debris mitigation guidelines implementing these. So I think that if we can do the comprehensive monitoring and make it very transparent who's complying and who is not, that will then empower states to be able to do something about uh, getting people into compliance. And I think that will so that will be the major part of the problem. Clearly, it doesn't help mm -hmm. the things that are already on orbit, but that's something that we have to live with. We have to live with the fact that in, in our bathtub, the bath water isn't completely clean, so to speak. One question from Joe Gerber. Um, are you concerned with Kessler syndrome as mega constellation from in form in, in Leo, or do you believe we will manage SDM better before this point? Yeah, so um, I'm not a complete believer in the Kessler syndrome. Uh, I believe that things do reach states of equilibrium when left uh, when left untouched. Uh, the thing is, is that you know we're launching sixty or more satellites every few weeks, especially. Uh, on behalf of SpaceX, we don't even know what equilibrium means. Like by pumping up all these objects every few weeks, we don't even allow mother nature to achieve this state of equilibrium. And so to me, it's like we're operating out past the headlights uh, of our vehicles. Uh, we're outpacing uh, science to be able to inform us on what's the right way to, to operate and, and, and put more objects on orbit. Great. One or uh, quick last one uh, to keep our 33 minutes are uh, uh, in shape from Sonai Sarak. Or is it possible to achieve a global space situation awareness architecture where civil and military work closely work together? Or do you think it is nearly impossible because of classified of the classified atmosphere? Yeah, so I think that um, each country that really cares about space situational awareness to whatever extent possible, having some of their own, uh, you know, national frameworks and that sort of stuff. I think people are pursuing that already, but I do believe that on the civil side, there certainly needs to be some sort of global consortium that brings all this together because it's in everybody's interest in terms of hiding things in space. Um, you know, physically hiding, that th those days are long gone. Uh, they're gone the way of the dodo. And I think anybody who doesn't realize that is just being naive at best. Um, if, if, it, if it's something that can be seen, it is seen, it is detected, it is tracked. And, and so uh, I think concealing things physically that way just doesn't make sense anymore. And, and people trying to behave in a way that they could, um, I think they'll soon find out that that's no longer possible. Right. Thank you very much. We are we kept up the time, um, Moriba. Uh, thanks for, for being so much on it. Um, we have a few more questions, and uh, as a message to all of you, uh, we will reach out to you. Or we will connect the mes messages or, or the questions to Moriba and try to answer them or all directly to you, as we all have your email addresses. So, um, thank you again. Our, um, our next webinars are on on the let me see here on the seventh of April with Rafael Rola, uh, Redken, who will speak with us about space finance, uh, an interesting topic these days, I, I would assume. And on April fourteenth with Carla Sharp, um, who will talk with us about space initiatives in Africa. We would like to get our, all of your feedback, so please check in with us on. Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, mobile, if you're interested in being our guest or on our 33 Minutes with, please let us know as well. So thank you again. Um, thank you, Moriba, and thank you to my entire team uh, behind the scenes to make it this, that seamlessly. Uh, so stay safe, wash your hands, and 
Thanks for joining us. See you next week. Ciao. Bye-bye. Thank you.